amazing love summed up in one word Jesus amen amen today we'll be looking at Psalm 130 we'll read the entire Psalm but I will preach from the first four verses by the grace of God if you have your Bibles turn with me to Psalm 130 A song of ascents. Your translation may say a song of degrees. Out of the depths I cried to you. I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark, that is, record or regard iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared I wait for the Lord my soul waits and in his word I do hope my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning yes more than those who watch for the morning O Israel hope in the Lord for with the Lord there is mercy and with him is abundant Redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. May God bless the reading of his word. Forgiveness is found in the Lord. Specifically, it is found in Jesus. That we may reverence him. Forgiveness fosters reverence. Today I believe we will see that from the text as well as as the illustrations. Not long ago uh, while driving in my pickup truck I was listening to the radio and, and heard just a, a tidbit of a story about a celebrity atheist, a woman who most definitely and decidedly does not believe in God. And yet she admitted to the interviewer that there was one thing about Christians or Christianity that she admired, forgiveness, and made the statement, I wish I had somebody to forgive me. Wow. Now let's compare that to Scripture. Nick, not wrong, wrong Pharisee. Simon, a Pharisee, invited Jesus to his house to have a one-on-one, -on -one, to have a meal, but over a meal in a, in a relaxed, cordial setting, probably the question, Jesus, what are you teaching? Why are you teaching this? What is, what is the deal? Because you're so radically different than what we know. And yet, Simon did not really show the hospitality of the day. In ancient Near Eastern culture, there were certain things that you do or did. They were somewhat ritualized, but you did them because you were showing a level of respect or compassion to a guest in your home while they are reclining at table. Now, if we were to have lunch together, we would sit at table and talk, or maybe afterwards uh, di get up from the table, go to a living room and, and sit on the couch or in chairs and, and discuss, maybe have a cup of coffee or two or three uh, or such. And so, you know, our, our culture is so very different. But in the culture, especially in the Hebrew culture, they recline, the tables were a lot lower to the ground, and so you reclined at table. So as they are reclining at table, a woman comes, and she's weeping, and she begins to cry at the feet of Jesus. Perhaps you can see that uh, on the screen uh, up here. And as she does so, she is wiping his feet with her tears. She's also brought a container of expensive perfume which she begins to anoint the feet of Jesus. And there sits Simon reclining. I said, if I can recline pretty good this morning. This, that's actually pretty good. I, I might just sit here the rest of the morning. No, I won't do that to you. But reclining at table thinking, you know, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is because she is a sinner. The Bible says... He, that is Jesus, said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. 
you gave me no kiss. Now, in the custom of the day, that's if you today now with uh, COVID we fist bump, but back in the old days we used to shake hands a lot or, or hug. You remember that, I'm sure. Uh, but in the Oriental cu culture, e try it again, Middle Eastern culture. Say that eight times really fast and see how you do. Uh, Middle Eastern culture, it was not uncommon to have a kiss on either side of the cheek. Sometimes in, in uh, French culture, you have probably seen that maybe in movies or such. That's what that kiss means. You gave me no kiss, but she has has not stopped kissing my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. You see, in that interaction between Jesus and Simon, Jesus tells a parable, the essence of which is the person who has much debt and is forgiven is going to show much gratitude or love. The person who has little shown uh, and little forgiven then loves little. It's just a, uh, the, the level of, um, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for. I don't want to say propensity, but that's a good word, so we'll go with it. Uh, and it's just, a, it's just a, a degree of measurement. But it applies to this woman because, like Simon said, she was of questionable reputation. She was a sinner and rightly so, to be condemned, and yet we don't see Jesus sitting there, get away from me. Oh, my goodness, can't believe you just untouched me. No, he shows grace, compassion, and love. In fact, the scripture says, and he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And then those who were reclining at table with him began saying to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. Who indeed, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away your sin, who takes away my sin. Psalm 130 is a, a psalm that is, its emphasis is on well, repentance on one side and forgiveness and therefore reverence on the other. It is part of a group. It is part of a group of psalms. Uh, psalms are the prayer songs of Israel, the hymn book of Israel. But they are inspired scripture. That means they are inerrant and infallible, and you can stake your life and your eternity on them. And they're called the Pilgrim Psalms. Psalms 120 to about 134, associated with King David. Back in the day... Uh, Hebrews would go up, or Jews, would go up to, to Jerusalem at different times of the year on pilgrimages because Jerusalem is situated on a very high hill or a small mountain, depending on how you want to define that. You are never, ever going down. You're always going up to Jerusalem. So these psalms would have been sung or, or chanted by worshipers going up to worship. Did you come to church this morning with a song in your heart, perhaps? Uh, I, I have a few that sometimes run on the soundtrack of my head. Now, that's either amazing and, and worshipful or it's disturbing. I will let you be the judge on that one. But, you know, to, did you come uh, to church with a song in your heart? Or maybe it was hard to do that this morning. I understand. I get it. But they came up to Jerusalem with these songs in mind. And some have also said that uh, the Levites and the priests who are at the temple, as they would ascend stairs to go to the actual temple complex and to the, uh, eventually to the courtyard of the priests where they're doing uh, their sacred work before God, would also probably sing or chant these very same psalms. And so it's, that's what it means when you see that little uh, title, which is part of verse 1, a song of ascent are a song of degrees because you're going up, up, and up. Dr. David Dockery and others tell us Psalm 130 is an individual complaint song and its feature is repentance and forgiveness. Now the psalmist did not clarify the nature of his troubles or explicitly confess sin, but he was aware of his sinfulness and the need for grace. Dr. Steve Lawson says... Every sin in the history of the world will either be punished in hell or punished in Christ. Who's the one that forgives you? Who's the one that takes away your sin? No matter how great or grave it may be, Jesus. 
Amen. Amen. Today in our text, in those first couple of verses of Psalm 130, we will see the distress of sin and of sinners. Again, in the King James, which is highly poetic, Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. This is not a psalm that is, oh God, please hear me. It's, it's not that at all. It is somebody who's crying out in desperation. It is a personal distress. Let me tell you, sin is always personal. No matter what public ramifications it may bring, it is always going to begin public. Um, always going to begin private and personal. And sin triggers distress. Jonah was a man who's personally called of God to deliver a message to the city-state of Nineveh, which is part of the Assyrian Empire. They were bad people. Okay, uh, they, they were extremely violent and brutal and vicious, and therefore the Jews hated them. And I suspect Jonah hated them with a passion. And so the message is simple. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will fall. A message of impending judgment. But being a Jew, Jonah also knew what kind of God he, ser he served. That Jehovah God is also compassionate, merciful, gracious, and who will respond to genuine repentance. And I suspect that Jonah wanted to see Nineveh burn. So knowing the kind of God that he served, he made the personal decision to turn away from God, to disobey God. He goes down to the seashore to, to buy passage on a ship headed to Tarshish, if I'm not mistaken. If I am mistaken, forgive me. So he buys passage. He goes down into the cargo hole where at some point in time he stretches out to take him a nice little nap as they're going to sail the Mediterranean Sea. God and His sovereign grace provides and prepares a great storm and a great fish. Notice I said fish, not a whale, because the Scripture does not say whale, so I will only go where the Scripture leads me. A great fish whose species may be unknown to us, but capable of swallowing a man whole. And as the storm erupted, the, the people on the boat, the people on the ship, excuse me, they are in great distress, but because of one man's sin. And therefore... They come down into the cargo hole. What do you mean? Sleeping. Get up there and you pray to your God. We're praying to our gods. Maybe yours will listen because our gods, they ain't so hot. That's my paraphrase of that passage. And so he tells them who he is. He tells them what he is. And he tells them the God that he serves, which is Jehovah God, Almighty God. And then he instructs them as to what they should do. Throw him overboard. And therefore, Jonah goes down into the sea. And by grace, God has prepared this great fish that then swallows him whole. And he goes down into the belly of the whale. Or some have conjectured, and I've seen one, not in real life, but I've seen a replica, a whale shark. They were prevalent in the Mediterranean Sea in those time periods. And they are, in some cases, quite big enough to swallow a man whole. I suspect he goes down in the belly of the fish. And there... He has an air pocket that's putrid. <clears throat> He's in the dark. He's down in the depths, surrounded by gastric juices and seaweed. And at that moment, God has Jonah's undivided attention. Sin brings distress. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when sin... Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. James 1, 14 through 15. This psalm writer, possibly King David, who knew a thing or two about the distress of sin. In this moment, Jonah is crying out to God in the dark, in the depths, and in desperation. Sometimes we have to be allowed to go there so that we may come into that marvelous, matchless light of Jesus. Applying that this morning, as we connect the dots from Psalm 130, verses 1 and 2, to the year 2021, September 26, sin should distress us. Our sin should distress us. The sin of others that we hear about, that we see about, all sin especially in our culture, big or small, 
It should distress us because it is offense to mighty God. We have all sinned. We are sinning or we will sin. And therefore we all need forgiveness and praise God that forgiveness is available and forgiveness is abundant. Are you in personal distress today over personal sin? If you are, good. Look to Jesus from your depths and in the dark. Come to Jesus out of your depths and out of your darkness. You have an open invitation and it is to the believer and it is to the non-believer today. Charles Spurgeon has said, repentance is as much a work or Try it again. Repentance is as much a mark of Christian of a Christian as faith is. A very little sin, as the world calls it, is a very great sin to the true Christian. Sin blocks our worship. It blocks our work for the Lord. We ought to be distressed by it. It plunges us to the depths. If we're honest. If we were to, I'm not, but if we were to ask for a show of hands, every hand ought to go up and say, Amen. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, don't want to go back again. The depths of defilement to be unclean. The depths of debasement. No, I'm not talking about like down in a basement, although that may be apt, but rather debasement, that, that being beat down when you're capable of an A game, but you're on the bench just debased the world looking and saying you're no good and doesn't even give you time of day depths of despair you know things like shame disgrace maybe disappointment maybe even maybe just even that sense of utter failure depths of de of depression or dis or desperation that sense of of guilt disgust with yourself a sense of hopelessness maybe even that of helplessness. Oh yeah, the Spirit is so willing. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to do better. And I'm not saying people don't have strong willpower. I have met some people. I can name you names of people I know whose will is an iron will. The, the Spirit is willing. But the flesh is often weak. Are you in the depths today due to personal sin? Good. Cry out to Jesus from that depth. Cry out to Jesus from that darkness. Cry out to Jesus in your despair, but in faith, knowing that He can, and He will, and He does hear you. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, which is a Hebrew word uh, for, it can be the grave, it can also mean the spirit world. In this case, most likely used as a very watery grave. He, out of the belly of Sheol, I cry, or Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. It goes on to say, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. It was a personal distress for Jonah, and it was a powerful distress. In Psalm 130, it's anguish. It is a heart ache and a heart break without compare. When King David made the choice, and it was a choice, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't, as I used to tell my, my Bible classes, especially Old Testament class, when, that when David looked at Bathsheba and he lusted after her, he didn't just have a uh-oh, it wasn't an uh-oh, it was a personal choice made and based on sin, a personal choice. When he chose to have the affair with Bathsheba and all of the attendant distresses that came with it, he felt the burn. Intense, emotional, mental, spiritual distress. It affected him. It even had a physical element to that. The Bible says in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. 
For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. David had to live with his conscience of all that he had done, not just for a few days or, or a few hours, but over the course of about a year or at least about nine months, covering up what he should have confessed up long before then until Nathan comes in and after a parable and David uh, stands up with righteous indignation saying that the person who stole this man's lamb and, and butchered it, he should, he's worthy of death, but he should repay many times over. And Nathan the prophet, perhaps an older man, points a, I like to think, a bony finger and says, you are the man. And David falls to his knees. He is exposed. He is, in our vernacular, busted. And he says, oh God, oh God, against you and you only have I sinned. He goes on to pray, create within me a clean heart. He knows Psalm 51. In the book of 1 Kings, Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple addresses private and public sin and the consequences and remedy. If and when famine and pestilence and blight or other manifestations of divine punishment began to appear, including plague and sickness, people were to look to the Lord, symbolized by lifting of, of hands and praying in the direction of the temple, especially if there are other areas. Would to God that the United States of America and the church of the United, within the United States of America would begin to lift up holy hands and say, Oh God, have mercy upon this nation again. Oh God, turn us from your wrath. Oh God, turn us back to you. Oh God, help us because we are a nation under your discipline and that blessing is rapidly fading fast. Oh God, once again, help us to be consecrated in your sight. Oh God, Create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit so that there may be forgiveness and blessing that flow yet again. But do we look to the Lord? Or do we look to ourselves and other means? Solomon describes sin and its distress as a plague of the heart. The Bible says, Whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own heart and spreads out his hands towards his temple, then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. 1 Kings 8, 37 through 40. It's distress sometimes is over the choices that we make. The decision to act on sin. The decision to act in sin. And it should grieve all. And it should grieve all who do so. Jonah spent three nights in the stomach of the great fish in the putrid darkness in an air pocket surrounded by seaweed and, as I said, stomach, stomach contents to think about his sin, to cry out in repentance from the depths. And David spent many months covering sin until exposed choices. There can be no peace between you and Christ while there is peace between you and sin. Charles Spurgeon. There's distress over conscience and conviction. Conscience is God's gift. It is a, a moral, spiritual barometer or thermostat. The Holy Spirit, as part of His job description in the Scriptures, has the power to bring a person under conviction, usually using conscience. And that being so, when one's sense of peace or wholeness or well-being is disturbed, thank God that David could not be comfortable in his sin. He could not enjoy long-term what he had done and what he had become. Even Jonah couldn't enjoy that little nap down in the, in the cargo hold because he had sinned against God and his conscience knew that. The Bible says when he, that is the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, 9. Ignore conscience. Resist conviction at your own peril. It can become scarred and calloused. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back. I would cure them. Matthew 13, 15. Dr. Steve Gallagher, or Reverend Steve Gallagher of Pure Life Ministry says, if a person remains in sin long enough, he can reach a point where he is no longer influenced by the Holy Spirit. 
He has become so hardened that he will not listen, does not want to hear. I think that describes Pharaoh in many cases. The person who has habitually gives himself over to sin loses the ability to feel sin's pain. Wow. Distress over consequences. Not only there's that distress over the choice, man, I can't believe I did that, and then feeling bad about it, and I mean really, truly bad about it, then, oh Lord, now what's going to happen? God, how, how are you going to discipline me? What, what, what type of consequence is going to befall? There are natural consequences related to choices and acts. If I put my hand on a hot stove, it's going to burn. It's going to hurt. It may leave a scar. God can use these as divine punishment. You say, well, you're, you're bringing down the tone of the worship. No, because everything God does in discipline is redemptive out of love, out of love because he wants to correct that behavior and to bring that child back to himself, never just to be a, a clenched fist, but always an open hand. There can be sometimes permanent consequences. David could not undo what he had done, but he could be forgiven and he could move forward a new man, even though he would still experience heartache and heartbreak over the consequences, there can be divine discipline and divine consequences. Jonah is an example of that. Those consequences did not necessarily last his lifetime, but they were a pretty powerful influence and impact in his heart and life during those three days in the body and the belly of the great fish. God has sovereign grace to redeem any purpose and all consequences. Choose the behavior, you choose the consequences, said Dr. Phil. So as we close, because we will look at the second part of this message next Sunday by the grace of God. Does sin plague your heart today? If it does, look to Jesus and call to Him from your depths. I cannot emphasize that enough. He knows your heart. There, there's no way that you can put a mask up and pretend. He knows, and He loves you anyway. He's willing to reach down into that putrid uh, uh, depth that you're in and pull you back up. And, I'm, and not just talking to an unbeliever who may for the first time come to salvation in Jesus Christ. That's awesome. But also to those who are believers who fall into sin. He's reaching out the open hand. Anguish and anxiety are part of sin's distress. Look at your sin or sins. Own it. Own up to it. Then give it up to Jesus who's already bore it at Calvary and he bought it at Calvary. And he can repurpose even your consequences. Choices, conscience, conviction, consequence, they can be part of the distress. It is a teacher. We are the pupil. So let us learn from it. Habits and attitudes, sins of the eye, sins of the flesh, sins of the pride of life. These things force us to look to Jesus for our hope and help because we do not have the ability on our own. But don't sear your conscience. Acknowledge your sin to Jesus. You don't have not to bear it any longer, not one second longer. And nor should you. You will find an outstretched hand, not a clenched fist, he forgives your sin just as easily as he forgave the sin of the woman who was anointing his feet because her sins were many. The invitation is open as our worship leaders come. And if you feel the need to come and to pray, then the altar is open for you to come and anoint the feet of Jesus with your tears and to perfume his feet, so to speak. Or it may be that some of you may for the very first time have heard the word of God with understanding and he's calling you to trust him. Call out to him from wherever depths you may be and whatever distress you may be in. He can hear you this morning and the hand is outstretched. Will you take it? Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation and won't you come this morning? <laughs>